Good afternoon. Good evening. This is Guillermo Sabatier. Uh, I'm your host for today's show on Perspectives on Energy. Uh, I'm Director of International Services for HSI, the Health and Safety Institute on Industrial Skills. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about DER, Distributed Energy Resource Integration, otherwise known as DERs. So I'll be using that acronym quite a bit. And we'll see how we're, how the industry is going to manage this integration, right? What we've done so far and you know where we're headed and what we're looking at in the future. Uh, definitely a lot of variables in here and, and a lot of things to discuss. So we're going to be talking about a few different items in here. Like uh, I've got a few bullet points that I've given myself to cover. Number one, uh, what is it, right? We're discussing defining what DERs are, uh, what DER integration is, and we'll cover a little bit of that. After that, we'll talk about how much penetration we've had so far and what that looks like up to now and how many, how much more of a widespread penetration we expect in the next two, five, 10 years. Uh, the next topic we'll, we'll talk about is, you know, the modeling and planning studies, right? Like, uh, like any, like any engineering job, it's you're you want to need, you're going to be presented with challenges as far as how this uh, particular new resource will impact your day to day operations. So, planning long term is a challenge, and modeling as well, but also day to day is going to present itself with some certain challenges when it comes to figuring out how to plan and operate your system. The other issue we're going to have, of course, is um, understanding, right, how, how this will benefit the utilities, how it will benefit the consumers, how it will benefit the industry, right? Uh, that's the other topic. And then the very end, right, we will talk about the the potential of uh, specifically consumers, right, when it comes to peer-to-peer -peer energy marketing possibility of being able to sell power and buy power between yourself and your neighbors or yourself and this whole pool of uh, DER energy producers at the residential level. For the most part, those are car consumers. Okay, so let's dive right in, right? So what is a DER, a distributed energy resource? So that could be anything like a solar, solar array on your roof, it could be uh, a regular old reciprocating engine uh, generator that you have on your house that runs on diesel or gasoline or natural gas. That's an example of that. You, you can have a battery banks that are already installed, like a Tesla Powerwall, for example, at a residential level. Or that could also be, for example, a um, heat pump system, right, as well. So we've those have been around for a while, but uh, those are now becoming getting popular again with how they can reduce the amount of power uh, that's that's expended. They can store some energy, or more importantly, they can actually re release some energy back into the system. And the other thing, of course, is uh, that which is becoming really, really interesting is the advent of electric vehicles and how that can be tied to the grid by the form of distributed energy resource management, right? Such as the availability of them at some point serving as energy storage. So um, the likelihood of people installing batteries in a house is not as high as the likelihood of people buying EVs, electric vehicles, and then charging it at home uh, during peak or off peak hours, right? So given that type of likelihood, now we're looking at the possibility of um, the distributed energy resources now being encompassed into the idea of not just solar panels on your roof, but also uh, your electric car on your driveway or your garage. So that's definitely going to be something that will be considered a DER uh, at the residential level. So an example of that. So one of the things that is is um, the terminology is you know we're, we all became consumers of electricity right but once you become a pro but you also produce electricity uh you produce more than you're consuming uh before you get to that stage you're somehow offsetting the amount of power that you're consuming because you're producing your own power uh once you get to the point where, where you have a, a net positive uh uh generation of power where you're actually feeding power onto the grid now you're becoming a prosumer which is a, both a producer and a consumer and of course that all depends on what time of the day you're looking at right so um th that's basically what what it is in a nutshell um integration in this regard is uh once these resources get numerous enough to the point that they reach a certain critical mass that they become a concern or an opportunity or or something that really impacts utility 
that's when integration becomes important, right? Now we're already looking at the at at the problems and the opportunities that are presented by rooftop solar. Uh, for the most part, there's a famous um, term known as the duck curve, uh, which is basically a, a midday peak demand has been reduced because of the output of all these like rooftop solar panels. Naturally, that reduces the amount of power being consumed. So then you have, for example, the uh, load curve is not going to be as high as it was forecasted. So at around 10 a.m., the load just dips and it comes back up again right before sun sunset. So ultimately, the load curve takes the shape of a duck, which hence why it's called the duck curve. So that in itself, each each year, as more and more solar panels are installed, that uh, the back of that duck curve gets lower and lower on that graph. So until eventually, you will get into a problem of uh, getting into the into a valley issue in the middle of the day. Most utilities have a valley issue at night, usually in when everybody's gone to sleep. There's not that much demand for power. They've had to cycle uh, generating units to be able to like uh, to be able to like, get rid of that excess power because they don't need it, and they're just basically running the base load units that are usually like in most cases nuclear or hydro or something that is rather inexpensive but rather large and difficult to cycle off and on. And a lot of places that are, those are the large nuclear plants, right? So they're, they they comprise uh, the base units in parts of the different parts of the country. That's also the large coal units, right? So usually cycling those or even redispatching those becomes cumbersome. So uh, as we you know replace uh, most of our coal fleet with natural gas, that those units are still rather large and difficult to maneuver, even even while burning natural gas. So part of that base load uh, gets affected by during the day now, when you actually get to the point where some of these valleys are actually lower than uh, in the day than they were at night. And we're seeing some of that happen already in places like California, places like New York, and places like even in the uh, Pacific Northwest. Well, they have a lot of solar facilities and even in Texas where they had the same issue with plenty of solar facilities that was uh, creating a valley problem in the middle of the day for them. Right? So uh, where are we when it comes to penetration? Well, we're talking about uh, that, uh, how the uh, load curve has been offset dramatically by the, uh, by the penetration of rooftop solar. And uh, somewhere about 20 or 30 percent at this time, right? We're looking at, at like a, another five or 10 percent increase year over year when it comes to uh, the, the rooftop solar installations. Along with that, we're going to see quite a bit of uh, batteries also installed, whether it's uh, electric vehicles, which would be the main driver, or it could be um, static. Uh, power wall type of setups that you have in your garage, right? So there, the limiting factor, of course, will be cost and will be availability given the fact that we don't have an infinite supply of lithium batteries or other. So there will be other type of technology that we're going to see being deployed. But for the most part, when it comes to vehicles, you're seeing you're seeing that, that uh, in itself is becoming a limiting factor. Now, there are certain incentives, given the fact that some utilities, of course, are um, getting to the point where they are looking at the, at maybe giving incentives away when it comes to having you install um, EV chargers at, at, you know, at, at the residential level. Like a, a certain companies here in Florida, for example, are giving you the incentive of uh, covering the entire cost of the hardware, the labor, the permitting of installing a level two charger at your house and also giving you unlimited off-peak off charging uh, for your EV, all for about $36 a month with a 10-year commitment. Um, I can personally tell you, charging my vehicle, my EV, uh, runs me about $120 a month. And uh, we use it a lot. So that's definitely uh, quite the savings there, and it'd be really worthwhile. So with that kind of incentive, I can definitely see people um, inching that 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 much closer towards making that decision and getting an EV, right? So the other challenge here, right, is um, the next thing topic that we're gonna discuss is the whole modeling uh, and planning study issues, right? So when it comes to modeling this type of resource in the past, uh, so far, all, all I've done with it is really treat it as negative load. So as a distribution circuit usually is radially fed, as they go out to from the stations to the feeders to out the laterals and the different circuits, uh, power flows in one direction from the source to 
to the load, right? In this case, now we're looking at what's happening is that um, for the most part, some of these rooftop solders, all they've done is really offset the amount of load being served because the customer is basically supplying their own their own load with their solar resources. As more and more of this grows, eventually you're going to see, of course, depending on the amount of real estate they have on their roof when it comes to solar panels or they install more efficient panels, yeah, you may get to the point where certain times of the year, if they're not running air conditioning, for example, or there's not a lot of load in the house, they may get to the point where they may be uh, at the point where their power is flowing back up the feeder, back up to the station, and back up through a transformer and into the transmission system. This is, of course, a concern for the uh, electric utility planners, especially the transmission planners, right? So modeling is one issue. I mean, how do you how do you model? Um, rather than taking a net number, uh, are you going to model this now a different way once you have, for example, a, a battery stored on there or a generator or some type of a generating resource, whether it's it's a uh, fuel cell or uh, an EV or something that's dispatchable at that point, right? So that's going to be one of the interesting challenges. There's quite a, quite a few algorithms right now. There's a lot of studies going on in place to figure out how this is going to be done. Ultimately, there are there are definite advantages to getting ahead of this, uh, specifically for the utilities. If they get ahead of this, and we'll cover this later on in, in the segment, but they they can definitely use this for their advantage if they are the ones that are managing the incentives and they're managing the rate of adoption. If this gets out of control, then it becomes much more difficult to to manage uh, for them, especially when it can it can really shift uh, the flows on a distribution circuit that's usually only flowing in one direction. So that could be a challenge as well. So uh, one of the biggest issues here, of course, is uh, planning planning the system from day to day. It is a quite a daunting task to do it on a transmission system, but it, it'll be infinitely more challenging to do this sort of next day planning on the associated distribution system. I mean, it's it's uh, the, the it'll be orders of magnitude more 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 complex and more granular when you add uh, uh, kilowatts rather than megawatts, right? Uh, and having to analyze all that down to the distribution circuit. So that in itself will be quite a challenge. Um, uh, a lot of machine learning and a lot of machine operations will have to take into effect. Uh, definitely some AI will be involved. And then in that case, you'll be seeing quite a bit of um, di uh, dispatchable resources that may be utilized by the utility uh, to offset their generation or maybe or maybe even supplement their existing generation. So, uh, so we'll, we'll jump ahead to that uh, a little later. But one of the things that we talked about as well is, is of course, uh, standards. There aren't any set standards at a national level. So like right now you have states like California, New York, Texas, even Florida, right? That that they all have, they all basically operate under their own rules. They have their own nomenclature. They have their own vocabulary and they have their own regulations. So uh, when it comes to the national level, I mean, NERC uh, has a few standards that, that in regards to uh, renewable resources and even storage. But uh, the challenge of course becomes, um, how do you deal with do distributed energy resources which are way below the threshold for compliance and reg regulatory oversight? So this will be a new challenge. So one of the things we, sh we, we should hope for and maybe strive for is perhaps a national standard or some additional standards itself, regulatory standards that cover distribution uh, distributed energy resources or at least aggregation. Um, now, we talked about the definite benefit for the utilities, right? And uh, one of the biggest challenges any utility has, of course, is, is uh, figuring out where to where to build generation, where to install it, uh, getting it permitted, you know, and, and of course, all the associated transmission that comes along with that. Very difficult thing to build those easements, very difficult to get approved. These site plans take years, almost a decade ahead to be able to put that together, right? Um, with these DERs, if they are the ones that are providing the incentives and controlling where they would prefer some of these uh, resources to be placed, they're they're now working in partnership with uh, residential, commercial, and industrial accounts to serve as microgrids or again distributed energy resources that together are aggregated and become a microgrid. A uh, perfect example of this is a couple of pilot programs that already have happened in the west coast of the U.S 
where they are looking at, well, they've already done this pilot test where they uh, were dispatching the electric vehicles as uh, a 15 minute generator, right? Meaning they they were discharging over a period of maybe one hour, right? And and they didn't use the entire capacity of the battery. They were just using it to, to supplement, for example, the generation that the utility didn't, didn't have. The other the other interesting benefit there is also uh, emergency power, right? So when when you have a certain loss of generation, you can call upon these different resources that are at the residential level and uh, use them as an aggregated uh, generator. So it'll be interesting because uh, there that that could present itself with a certain type of um, level of reliability, in if it's managed correctly. So the only way that the utility can actually stay ahead of this is they are the ones that are ma- they're controlling, for example, uh, when, where, and how, and how much uh, is installed. And the best way they can do that is actually making sure they're in, they're they regulate the uh, permitting process when it comes to installing both solar sites and also. Uh, energy storage at the residential industrial commercial level so now comes the third the third and fourth party into this equation which is really the uh, a if you have evs the automaker has to definitely uh buy in and approve the use of their of their product as as a uh, as an energy resource right which of course this you know can kind of get into some kind of warranty issues but of course i'm sure that can be that can be worked around given the fact that the automaker will of course i'm sure benefit or profit somehow from this particular arrangement so that could be a partnership with the customers the automaker or the hardware manufacturer and the utilities um, there could even be a fourth party now that involves an app where this brings us to the final point that i wanted to make in this case which is the uh, peer-to-peer energy marketing so Imagine you are now in a community where you have a certain type, certain size batteries, you got two EVs, you got solar panels, your neighbors only have solar panels. Um, you are then decided to, you're not going to drive for the next couple of days as you work from home and you're relaxing. So you decide to put the stored energy on that car for sale, um, you know, at a certain price. And uh, I guess now you're selling it at, at peak. And it's going to be a lot less expensive because you charge it off peak and now you're going to sell it on peak and you're going to sell it for less than the utility and you'll sell it to your neighbors or whatever pool within your particular neighborhood at, at, a, at, a, at a price that's competitive with the utility rate. Right? So this whole peer-to-peer energy marketing gets to the level of granularity where you're basically using the the low voltage system out there, which is usually the, the distribution buses, right? Uh, to be able to buy and sell power of, you know, be, be, between the close neighbors. Or you can sell your power to a, an aggregator, which is uh, somewhere up into the uh, distribution system. And of course, you know, be able to participate in these uh, DER aggreg- aggregator markets. At the end of the day, I mean, not even do any of that. You can just be uh, available for dispatch for the utilities. Say, for example, the utility needs help during the, um, what they call the end, the end of, of the, uh, the beginning of the lighting peak where all of the solar power goes away. And now it has to turn on a bunch of generators to be able to manage, for example, the sunset, which is what they call the lighting peak. Usually a lot of stress in the system. So if you have a lot of resources out there at the load, which is really, really the best place to have it, now you can support uh, both the, the, the demand that, that, that increases rapidly over, over a short period of time, which is usually one hour. And I've seen them go up maybe two to 3,000 megawatts in a, in a one hour period. And they'll come down just as quickly. So, so that's... Uh, an example where DERs could serve the utility if the utility you know had the ability to manage them and use them as a generating resource. So that's one example. Uh, the other example, of course, is just being available for dispatch uh, should an emergency arise or should the utility need, for example, additional generation in a real hurry or they need help with voltage or even frequency, depending on what sort of control or inverter system you have. Right. So these, these uh, possibilities become really interesting. Uh, I think we're only a few years away from that being widespread. Uh, really, the only barrier now is is, is the uh, widespread adoption of electric vehicles, or at least widespread adoption of uh, small storage devices in, in at the residential, commercial, industrial level. But uh, the the future is not far off, and, and we're, we're going to get there pretty soon. Um, naturally, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? There's a lot of uh, unknowns regarding these sort of planning studies and how we're looking at. 
There's, uh, there's different utilities are taking different approaches as to how to best plan and mitigate and try and predict. Because of course, with this sort of prediction requires the, the reallocation of a lot of resources. Just by the mere fact of um, providing incentives for the installation of all these devices, it, you know that has a cost. But then, I mean, you may offset the cost of uh, building generators or, or transmission lines, but uh, that only depends on, on on a certain level of adoption. So if you don't have that level of adoption, you're looking at a challenge of, of course, you know, having made that investment and uh, and and ultimately. The, the other challenge as well is uh, if people buy these vehicles, are they going to participate on this, uh, what they call dispatch market, right? So that's the other thing. So you have, you also have to incentivize that, that, that particular product as well. So um, usually that's, that has become with so many different variables and so much different volatility on all these factors. Uh, they're doing what they call a least regret analysis, which usually involves why the they're they're not trying to to um, predict every single scenario. They're just trying to predict uh, or come up with different plausible scenarios so you can give yourself room to be able to adjust as things adjust. Now this tells you how how difficult it's been over the last five even five years when in Europe Australia when dealing with these resources and they've had they've been far ahead when it comes to legislation and public appetite for it but at the same time there hasn't there hasn't been the adoption that everybody was hoping for especially at the utility level right um from their perspective so so not not as many customers had got on board as the utility had hoped uh so there has to be a different way of looking at this when it comes to providing incentives so ultimately um these did different topics you know we talked about what it is we talked about where we are right now as an industry or percentage we talked about the challenges when it comes to modeling and planning and how we come up with studies to be able to do a long term, near term and next day. And we also looked at, you know, examples of uh, some of those different states that are very progressive and forward looking that went ahead on their own. But now they all have a different hodgepodge of terms and protocols and, 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 and uh, procedures that don't quite line up with each other. So that's examples of states I gave. But at the very end, I just talked about the you know the benefits that this could bring if managed correctly, and why it's you know, imperative for the utilities to really be at the forefront of this sort of uh, process and uh, with the incentives that they can offer. So I've already seen that happening in my state, uh, specifically with the uh, electric vehicle chargers. Uh, namely the level two chargers and those are those are going to be interesting because uh one of the plans is of course is that one of the larger utilities in florida is planning to have uh, uh a uh, level three charger at every gas station in florida so that could be a monumental shift when it comes to uh range anxiety for most of these uh, perspective uh, perspective ev owners so once you have the availability of charging your car anywhere you go that, or anywhere that there's a gas station, then you know that sort of uh, abates and alleviates some of that fear and anxiety when it comes to owning an EV. So that's the case. You know, you you can see a lot more adoption. But along with that, you know, uh, something everybody always talks about is you know, can the utility handle? Can the system? Can the grid handle all this additional load? And when you look at it, it's almost as if you're think of it. Uh, charging an EV it takes about maybe two to four hours. Uh, think of it as running your dryer for two to four hours. That's how much load you put on the system. So it is significant, right? But um, so it requires a little bit of planning, a little bit of preparation, which is why some of the utilities now are deciding when you can charge your vehicle. And it'll usually be off peak, which of course helps them deal with their valley issues. So again, that's another idea when it comes to DER integration is, you know, learning how to, manage this, this resource, you know, and, and to benefit the utility and benefit the grid. Right? So uh, hopefully we'll uh, have an, another segment on this particular topic as things develop. Um, but uh, I will be attending a few seminars coming up on specifically DER integration. So whatever I learned there, that's different from what I talked today or new, I will be sure to have another segment that will um, discuss this even further. So once again, I look forward to sharing this. I know that the uh, people in Hawaii and, of course, the rest of the world are always, always interested on uh, renewable resources and uh, getting towards that uh, net, z not just net zero, but real zero right, when it comes to uh, generating energy and using energy. So um, this place like Hawaii, for example, this, this is really important. 
So um, again, thank you all for uh, your time today. I really appreciate the presence and and uh, I look forward to some of the questions, hopefully in the uh, in the comments below. So I'll try and get to them and answer them as much as I can. And uh, I, I look forward to any and all questions. So okay. have a wonderful day. And uh, this resume this uh, pretty much concludes our our show for today. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.